this is uh, where all the action is. The posters, the badges, where the mail order happens and you know our, our merchandise is the, the beautiful new weekend album Jinx and you know there's the the different the different cover art that got used for the poster and the CD has a different cover than the than the LP and fabulous wax idols discipline and desire in stores now this is the uh, most recent mantles album another beautiful record black tambourine compilation is the band i was actually in you can see the hilarious uh, picture of me with hair hair in 1989 1990 perhaps <laughs> The good old days. The most recent Veronica Falls record, which I'm, I'm quite proud of. I think it's one of the best pop records of all time, I might even say. The Fabulous Pains of Being Pure, pure at Heart of first album. One of my crowning achievements. Very proud of that record. Proud of them all, though. You know, we had our, our 20th anniversary a few years ago, and, you know, like, it's a fair amount of press. Like, I did a lot of interviews, and I was, you know, I'm like, like, oh my God, I can't believe anyone wants to talk to me. But it was kind of amazing, like looking back at, you know, when I'm, we started the label and you know, the very modest nature of our goals of putting out, you know, three records or something. And the idea of 20 plus years later, like I, I just put Slumberland 199 into production. And, you know, it was kind of amazing, like thinking about that and thinking about how much the music business has changed and how hard it is and, you know, still doing it like by myself pretty much you know sitting in a room by myself and it's kind of uh, I don't know it's just it's it's interesting <laughs> uh, well we put out our first release in December 1989 we had sort of started kind of toying with the idea of doing a record label you know a few months before that I mean obviously it takes a few months to make a record but there were a group of us um, like eight or ten of us that had met in college at University of Maryland and uh, we were DJs at the radio station and we were kind of into the same records and we all started hanging out and going to shows together and most of us had never really played music before or had even really picked up an instrument. I certainly hadn't um, and we were just kind of excited about like the Lower East Side noise stuff like the Unsane and like Drunk Tank and the Dust Devils and we were really into K stuff and we were really into creation and, and postcard and you know post-punk and you know like rough trade label and, and we just started bands like we were just kind of like for me it was I think Jesus and Mary Chain it was you know like the singles from Psycho Candy when those were coming out and I just thought like I can make music, like if anyone can make, you know, it was the whole punk rock thing, like anyone can make music and people can contribute. So we all, a bunch of us just kind of started bands and they were mostly kind of weird noise bands and because we didn't really know how to play, it was all very primitive. We didn't have, you know, studio gear. It's not like today where people have laptops and, you know, nice microphones, you know, we were recording on four track cassettes. And we just thought, um, you know, we started playing shows and we just thought we should document what we're doing and make some recordings and then maybe put a record out. I worked in a record store and a couple of the other guys also worked in record stores. And so we kind of had an idea about, you know, how distributors work and what you could do once you actually have, you know, a thousand records sitting under your bed. Like, what do you do with them? Um, so the idea of just doing a single, a compilation single with three of the bands on it and then I think we figured we would do that and then do two more singles from two of the other bands and maybe that would be it. We didn't know, we didn't really have any kind of a plan, you know, as this like ongoing thing. We just wanted to put out, like have each band represented by a record. And then who knows? <laughs> I moved here in uh, spring 1992. Um, you know, you kind of get to a point when you're in your twenties, you kind of want to move away from home, like the place that you grew up. Like you have an idea about going somewhere and. You know, I used to spend a lot of time in New York, um, you know, go up for shows and go record shopping. And I thought maybe I would move to New York and go live in the Lower East Side, which, you know, then was a pretty different scenario than it is now. It's so gentrified now, but then like Tompkins Square Park was still closed from riots and, you know, it was pretty scary. And uh, this woman that I was seeing at the time went to Berkeley. She went to Cal Berkeley and I came out to visit and California is beautiful. It's like a marvelous place and the Bay Area is beautiful. And I came and spent a few days out here and 
like went to Amoeba and bought records and it's like, wow, this is gorgeous. I'll move there instead. And I just went home, talked to my boss, gave, gave notice, set, uh, just picked a date, April 1st or something. And like, I'm leaving, I'm gonna move to California. And at that point, a lot of the people, you know, who I had worked on the label with, it was kind of a collective, they were in this band Velocity Girl and they had just signed the Sub Pop and they were kind of blowing up and they were busy. They were touring all the time and it was kind of, it had kind of become mostly me doing all the work for the label anyway. And also by that point, we had started putting out records by other people and it was more of like an ongoing thing. Like what's the next release, you know? keeping it going and involving other people. So I just brought the label with me. You know, we didn't, I don't remember there being a lot of discussion. I was sort of doing most of it anyway. So Slumberland came with me. So that's how Slumberland became an Oakland label. I mean, I can't put out all the stuff I like, you know, even, even given the fact that, you know, I get whatever, a hundred times more demos than I could possibly ever listen to. There's still, you know, more records that I would love to put out than I could possibly afford to put out. I mean, I'm just one person you see in the, sitting in this room doing everything. And there's only so much that I can do. So, you know, usually it's just something, I don't know, there's just something kind of unquantifiable about a, a record or a band that kind of hits me in the gut. And it's, you know, it's like, this isn't just something I like, but this is something that kind of fits in, you know, with our aesthetic or, you know, the story that I'm trying to tell with the label. Um, it's like an X factor kind of thing, I guess, you know? I don't generally, you know, I think a lot of the criteria that like more serious labels might look at, like does this band tour? Do they have a booking agent? You know, all those kind of things. Like I probably should be looking at that kind of thing a little bit more and I might have an easier time of it. But so many of the bands that I like are just starting out and you know, they haven't quite put all those pieces together or maybe they never will. But I still think that their music deserves to be heard and in some way, like I feel like it, it adds to what, you know, to what we've created with the label. Weekend is an obvious band to talk about. I don't even remember how I found them. I think somebody had sent me a link to their MySpace and they had posted up some demos on MySpace and they sounded crazy. It sounded completely shitty, like blown out, recorded on, I don't even know what. But there was just some kind of interesting quality to the noise that just really appealed to me. And I messaged them through MySpace and they said, oh, we're playing this noise pop showcase. And I went to see them play and it just blew me away. And, you know, usually I find bands, you know, like through her friends or friends and, you know, people, a band on tour will have a great band, you know, play with them in some city and be like, oh, you should really check this band out. They played with us in, you know, in LA and they're really cool. It's not very often that I get a demo cold, you know, like someone hand, someone comes up to me at a show and hands me a tape. I'm like, wow, that was really amazing. And like the Ropers were one of those cases, like some kids I didn't know at all who handed me a demo tape and Henry's Dress was like that as well, which is like for me, one of my favorite bands. And the, the I, I got handed this demo tape at the record store I worked at and, and I was like, Henry's Dress, I don't know about this name. You know, the name didn't really grab me and I just filed the tape away. And then the somehow, one of the the members of the band had gotten my phone number and kept calling, did you listen to our demo yet? And I said, I was kind of like, how did you get my phone number? That's a little weird. You know, because it was my home phone because, we, you know, I was a part-time business. I mean, I've never had like a Slumberland business line for people to call. So I thought it was a little weird. And finally, after she, she called a few times, I said, you know, I should just listen to this demo so I can say, look, I don't like your band. Please stop calling me. And I listened to it. And it was like the best thing I've ever heard in my life. And, I, and I, I, I was like, God, I can't believe I didn't listen to this like four months ago and I've probably totally blown it and you know, they, someone else is gonna put this record out and I'm such an idiot. And I called her back and I was just like, your demo just killed me, like please tell me, like you, you, know, you still wanna do a record with us. The Mantles, yeah, that was a, a band who I've been following for a while, you know, they're local. And uh, I was actually in a band with the bass player from The Mantles 10 years ago or something, we were in a band together. Um, and I used to go see them play and, you know, I just thought they were great. Hello, what is it like there where you are? Hello, 
kind of kept talking to them about doing a record, but then the timing was never quite right. And they're like, oh, we just agreed to do a single with this, this other label. And I was like, what gives, man? Slumberland, come on, we're cool. <laughs> and then eventually it just kind of came together and you know, came up with this idea of having Kelly Stoltz record the record because I really like the sound of the stuff that he does. And I, I couldn't be any happier. I mean, you know, it took five years to finally get a record out of this band, but you know, I'm so excited about how it came out. And I think the band's really happy with it. Wax Idols, you know, I think people feel like, well, that's kind of a weird band for Slumberland to be putting out. You know, they, Is it still I guess, I don't, you know, I, I think people, a lot of people have just like a weird impression of like the stuff we put out. I mean, like I look at our catalog and I think it's extremely diverse, um, but a lot of people think, oh, it's all pop and it's all, you know, like upbeat, like, Twee pop stuff, I, which I, I don't know. I, I just think it's weird. I mean, I feel like we've hardly ever put out, like we've put out 200 records and like maybe three of them you could classify as twee, but you know, whatever. That's just the, you know, our burden <laughs> that we have to carry around. So, you know, when we do like a band like Weekend or a band like Wax Idols, people are like, man, that is just so weird for Slumberland. Why are putting out this crazy music as if, you know, you can only like one kind of music or something. Heather is such a character and she's very, you know, outspoken and she's very vocal and she, I think she's extremely talented and, you know, I, I feel really lucky to, to get to work with, with her. You know, she's just so, like, intolerant of bullshit and she's so, like, really, like, fiercely protective of her art and I, I like people who are not afraid to go against the grain and to honestly just don't care what you think about them. You know, they just, they do their thing. They know it's good. And, you know, they don't need constant approval. Probably something that links a lot of our bands <laughs> because they don't get constant approval. Spectrals is one of the other current groups. Stuff kind of is influenced by like pub rock and really power pop like Nick Lowe and Elvis Costello. I'm super proud of it. I think it's it's great. JR from Girls produced it. He recorded it here in San Francisco. Yeah, it's Sob Story. In stores now. It's a very good record. I mean, he's a great songwriter and he, very young. I mean, he was, I think he's only 22 now and this is already his second album. And uh, he's just, he's kind of the dude. <laughs> I mean, it would have to be, you know, like the first Lily single, like February 14th, I think is like, I mean, I love all my children, but I would have, you know, that's like one of my favorite Slumberland singles. I think it's just really quintessential. Um, you know, something off the Stereo Lab comp, you know, the Rocket Ship album that we put out is, you know, I would humbly submit is a bit of a, <laughs> like an indie pop classic. And, you know, that there's some great songs on that. I'm Lost Without You Here. And, you know, the Eiler set I don't, or put out some amazing records and, you know, I would have to, you know, include a track off that and, um, I, you know, The Pains of Being Pure at Heart, obviously, you know, even just that song, The Pains of Being Pure at Heart, <laughs> is, uh, you know, to me that's a classic. I mean, I think some of their songs are songs that are being, you know, played the indie disco, you know, at peak time, like forever, you know, they've kind of entered that canon. I think that's really impressive. As we were kind of talking about how much recorded music there is now and, you know, sort of like this weird inverse relationship between how how hard it is to, to get paid for putting out music, but how much music there is being put out. It's, uh, you know, there's a lot of noise out there and it's, it's hard to get heard and Everybody I know who writes about music says they get way too many emails and they can't listen to everything. Um, I'm sure editors have a hard time. I mean, everybody is just absolutely bombarded by music and the way the whole online, like, six hour news cycle <laughs> works, you know, where people are just posting up tracks every day. You know, every morning, everyone goes to Pitchfork. What did they post? And what stereo I'm gonna post this afternoon and what self-titled posting. And it's just this constant barrage of new music and music news and, you know, a million different bands and different labels. And when we were doing records in the 90s, 
you know, it was very hard to compete with like Homestead, Sub Pop, Merge, like SST, like the big labels then for coverage in, you know, what the outlets were then, alternative press and, you know, option and, you know, those print magazines. I mean, yeah, they all had to print a lot of stuff, but it tended to be, you know, the bigger labels would have more success getting in there. There was more at stake because it was print and there was more like, you know, kind of pressure to do print advertising. And now, you know, it's kind of cool legitimately, like someone can put something up on Bandcamp, you can send some links out. Maybe you craft that email in just the lucky way that the subject line really catches someone's eye and they look at it, they listen, boom, they post it that afternoon and next thing you know, people are tweeting it and you know, there's, a, a, like that, that whole mechanism can work really well, you know, in some ways if you, if you are lucky enough to cut through the noise. Yeah, uh, it's all pretty much gotten worse. <laughs> no, I won't say that, but I've always done it myself, you know, since, since I came out here, since it, we kind of transitioned out of it being the collective effort sort of thing. And, you know, even in the 90s when people were still buying music, like back in the good old days when people went to record stores and bought records every week, it was still, you know, financially really difficult and for, a small label, you know, even if you have a record that's doing well and does more than break even, the money that you see from that comes months and months later. So you always have issues managing, you know, cash. And I always had a full-time job while I was doing the label. So it's always been a bit of a challenge. You know, we're kind of like, I'm very productive. <laughs> you know, not to like pat myself on the back too much, but I can get a lot of shit done. So people often think that we're a bigger label, like they think that there's a room full of people doing stuff because I put a lot of records out and, you know, I can get a lot done. But it's really just me, so it's kind of gated by how much I can accomplish and how much, you know, money is on hand. And a lot of those cash flow issues never go away when you're a small label. You're always kind of like month to month and how's it going to work out and, you know, unless you have an Arcade Fire record or something, like a record that really, really brings in a lot of cash, it's a, it's a challenge. You know, I'm approaching 50 years old and, you know, at some point, like I can't imagine being 70 and still running the record label, you know, maybe I will be. I mean, to me, a lot of like, the, like the fun of it and a lot of like what made me want to do it was, I, I was a record collector and, you know, a music fan, but I really love records and like doing records has always been really important to me and it seems weird to be tied to a physical format, but I kind of feel like if it really became like financially just impractical to press records, like maybe I would not do the label anymore because the idea of just doing it digitally, I, I don't know, it just does not appeal to me very much. You know, for the amount of time and effort that it takes to do this, um, and you know the the rather modest rewards that come from it like i feel like one of the, the great things is i get to hold that record in my hands you know i have that 12 inch lp that's like the thing that my favorite bands put out and the the records that i love the most that you know mean the most the most to me like those are records you know they're not cds and they're not digital files they're records and that's kind of like my my love of music is to me is in some weird way like so tied up with that so i kind of feel like if the day comes when the pressing plant says, sorry, you know, we're closing our doors, I kind of feel like, eh, maybe that would be a good stopping point. <laughs>